Good afternoon and welcome to the 2019 AWS Public Sector Summit ASEAN Singapore. I'm Michelle, one of your room hosts, and I have some important housekeeping information to share with you before the session begins. Emergency exits are located outside this meeting room. Bathrooms are located uh, as you turn right after leaving this room. Please remember to silence all your devices. Please also download the event app as it will help you schedule your day. It is also where you can share feedback with us after every session you attend today. All AWS sessions you see today are being recorded and available after the session via content devices on exit. Now, please welcome to the stage Peter Shi from AWS who will present on Making Friends with Finance, How to Manage Cost Efficiency and Budget on AWS. Thank you, Peter. All right, thank you. Hope everyone had a nice lunch and summit so far. How's the food? Enjoyable? Good? Um, so my name's Peter, as mentioned. I've been with AWS for a while now, about three years, working with many different customers on managing spend and efficiency. Now, I guess as people are trickling in, quick show of hands, who's in, say, the finance procurement function uh, in your business today? No one? Great. Then. After this talk, you might be all start making new friends in your companies with the finance and procurement functions. With cloud spend and AWS, we always want to try to stretch our budget as much as possible to get more done on the cloud. And this is what today's talk will be all about. Um, predominantly, I'll be covering three different areas. Firstly, introduction to cloud economics and why millions of customers are using AWS. Secondly, I'll be covering managing cost efficiency. So a few different ways you can save, but with management, usually you want to measure that as well. So how might you go about measuring that efficiency? And finally, um, having worked with a few customers, I'll be sharing how other customers manage their spend against budget, against forecasts, to, making to be making sure they're getting the value out of the spend. And so starting with cloud economics, for those of you who run on-premises infrastructure, this might be fairly familiar to you because with on-premises infrastructure, due to the long lead times, long procurement times to install it, rack it, stack it, and set up the switches, quite often you need to provision much higher than what you currently need. AWS, on the other hand, allows you to fit much closer to that white dotted line you see. So the white dotted line is your actual IT demand, and cloud lets you fit very close to that. One example that happened recently is um, from where I'm from, and you might be able to guess from the accent of where that is, the country was running a census. And as you know, with census uh, events, you want to have everyone answer the questions about where they're from, uh, their backgrounds, uh, all on the same time and the same day. Now, that census was run on traditional infrastructure. And unfortunately, the traditional infrastructure couldn't quite handle the amount of load. And so the challenge was it had to be done manually and over time instead. And so the government, after this incident, decided that uh, let's not let that happen again and let's make sure we can meet our peak demand next time around. And so the government selected AWS and PwC as a partner to serve the 2021 census. And so beyond avoiding that initial capital waste, AWS also lets you meet the peak customer demand whether it be you're running a business or running a government service. Now, also, if you happen to meet or miss that peak demand, what tends to happen is uh, the management team will say, hey, let's avoid that from happening again, and let's provision a lot more infrastructure if you were doing traditional infrastructure. Again, resulting in some additional waste. And so AWS lets you both avoid the waste and meet the peak demand. Now, Another interesting area about cloud and AWS is it's quite different to tradi traditional infrastructure. You can optimize your spend after you actually provision it. And so I'll be talking a good amount about what activities you can do after the resources are installed and provisioned. And so beyond the activities that you can do and the fact that it can help you meet peak demand and avoid waste, there are also other things that happen that allow you to drive greater 
effective use of your capital. The first one is as AWS grows over time, uh, the economies of scale allow us to share the efficiencies with our customers. And so since 2006, we've actually dropped our prices uh, over 70, at 73 times. And recently with the new developments of new instances and new uh, architectures, uh, for example, the M5 instance is about almost 30% more price performant relative to the previous generation. And so in using AWS, you get to take advantage of these new technologies as they come about. Second, you also take, can take advantage of the tiered pricing. So as you use more, uh, you get tiered discounts over time. And also there are additional credits and discount programs available as well uh, for startups and also for large migrations, for example. And finally, you can also lower the costs of your experimentation drastically. Um, there are many pre-existing templates available, and through cloud, there's a thing called cloud formation, which allows you to pre-bake and pre-prepare templates of infrastructure, so uh, infrastructure as code, if you will. The other day, I was just trying something out myself and following an example guide, and in the space of two hours, I was able to set up a music streaming service uh, with a few instances, and I had a login and password and could listen to some music. And the sheer speed at which you can achieve that is just incredible in the cloud. The other thing about uh, lowering the cost of experiments is that you can actually turn off your experiments if they don't work well. So for example, if you were serving a new customer base out in a different part of the world, say for example, Europe or Africa, you can turn on some resources there, try it, see if it works, and if it doesn't work, you can switch it off. To do this with traditional infrastructure would take months, if not years of planning a large amount of capital, uh, investing in researching in partners that are available in the area. For AWS, it's a few clicks on the console and you have your resources. Now, to close out the cloud economics piece, beyond cost savings, we also see customers gain greater staff productivity, greater operational resilience, and also greater business agility as well. So from a productivity perspective, there's less time for your staff to wait around for your resources to spin up, um, less downtime as well. Operationally, you can have better service level agreements, uh, reduced mean time to recovery and reduced outages, which is a big reason why many customers use AWS. And finally, the agility, the access to advanced technologies like AI ML across 165 services on AWS, a lot of the technology is pre-baked for you, ready to use. And so, Customers like Busy have managed to save 83% uh, of time in deploying their SAP environments. Customers like S uh, SUSS have managed to achieve 99.999 availability and uptime of their student learning platform that's been developed on mobile phones to serve learning content to the students. And uh, iTrueMart, a e-commerce company in Thailand, managed to scale 1,000% in a single year and also they reduce their dev time by months as well. Very, very difficult to achieve otherwise outside of cloud. Now, switching gears slightly, uh, efficiency. As uh, someone who loves getting bargains and driving efficiency in my own life, uh, AWS, you can drive efficiency there as well. Now, one reason why we care about efficiency is we want to keep our promises to our customers. We promise our customers that through using cloud, through using AWS, you're going to get a lot of cost savings. And achieving these cost savings is a bit of a shared responsibility uh, because we can provide you the advice and provide you with many tools that help you drive this efficiency. Uh, but at the end of the day, the customers or maybe your managed services partners will need to take the actions to realize those benefits. Now, the most common ways I've seen customers drive efficiency and get a lot of value without too much time investment, because it's always a balancing game between how much time do I spend on this versus how much time do I develop new apps. And the quick and easy ways are largely listed here. So the first one is, you know how I mentioned that resources on your traditional environments tend to be over-provisioned? You can size them down, fit to a better size to what you actually need. And you can also delete unused things as well. Uh, the second thing is when you go home at night, you turn off your lights in the office, most people, um, and on AWS, you can actually switch off your resources and actually stop paying for them. 
The third one is using reserved instances. So they're a commitment to AWS and you say, hey AWS, I'm going to use your resources for the next one year or maybe three years, uh, please give me a discount. And there's a uh, service or function that allows you to do that. And finally, there are countless ways in which you can design for cost. And so I'll be sharing with you a few different ways in which design can have a big impact on cost efficiency. Now, if you need to go to the shops and maybe buy a carton of milk, and you happen to have a scooter and a big truck, you can choose one or the other. It will get you the same outcome. You'll get your milk, but one costs more to run and one costs less to run. And so sizing resources appropriately is really about picking the right tool for the job. Um, there are many different instance types that AWS provides as new technologies develop. For example, for accelerated computing and graphical processing, you've got things like the P and G instances. And AWS also provides the tools in which you can helps you pick the right instance. And so from a migration perspective, um, we have tools like TSO Logic that can help size your resources. And after your resources are on AWS, there are also tools provided to you as well. This is one of the resources available to you after you're on AWS, and it's called Trusted Advisor. Trusted Advisor, out of the box, comes with four different checks, and if you have business support, it comes with 11 different checks. And it allows you to find those unused resources that can pop up over time, uh, whether it be through automation or someone simply forgot to switch things off afterwards. And it can delete old things uh, like old snapshots and says, you haven't been using this for a long time, do you want to delete them? and have a think about that. And so, because this part of the talk is about managing your spend, you know, when it comes to management, it's always a good idea to measure it as well. And so, the first type of metric you might put in place is of the right sizing tool uh, savings that it's suggesting, plus the trusted advisor savings. How much is that as a proportion of my total? And that'll give you an idea and a percentage by which to track and improve. So if you remember the bit about turning off your lights uh, outside of work times, doing this for compute resources, doing this for database resources can deliver up to about 70% savings. Uh, that's because 70% of the hours in a week are non-working hours for uh, most companies. Um, in this example, you can see the red area is where the resources are on. And the white area is times and uh, space where the resources are off and not costing anything. Each of the little vertical lines, the thin vertical lines you see, represent the five days of the week. And each of those batches of lines are separate weeks. And so for this customer, you can see with the real data there, about half the space or so is red, half the space is white. So they're saving about 50%. And one day, they decided to implement a policy that said, okay, how about we just switch off our resources at night and there'll be no automatic switch on in the morning. What they found was about half of that solid red bar disappeared. And that was because in this big company, um, many resources were simply unused and they didn't need to be on every single day. Uh, as a developer, you don't, always have to log into every single one of your servers to test something during that day. Sometimes you only need to access a certain portion. And so after they implemented automatic switch off, that saving increased from about 50% all the way up to 70%. From a metric perspective again, one way you could measure that is measuring how low does it actually get on the weekends compared to how high does it get on the weekdays. And that metric will give you the on-off scheduling or elasticity metric of your cloud. And you can find this in a tool on AWS called Cost Explorer. If you take a daily view, you can see on weekends how much does it cost and on weekdays how much does it cost. So the third area is once you're happy with your resource size, once you're happy with this turning on and off, you can consider reserving the capacity and saying to AWS, hey, please give me a discount. I'm going to be using you guys for a while. And for this particular customer, they managed to save 39% off of their unit cost by using reserved instances. 
Now, as customers ask for more things, AWS builds out more things. Um, quick fun fact, if you haven't heard it before, about 90 to 95% of AWS's roadmap is based on customer ask. And so if you have any asks and you're using AWS today, quick show of hands, who's using AWS today? About half the room, very cool. Yeah, talk to your account manager, request some things if there are technical challenges you have. Um, we have support which will help you out, but also from a feature perspective, if it's missing something, there's a system where we can make requests. And so every year we release many new features and products, um, and part of this is new features to existing products. And so from a reserved instance perspective, they save somewhere between 20 to 40% usually, but if you're willing to commit for a long time, then it can save up to 75%. And they're available for many of our services from compute to database, uh, to caching and so forth. Now, there's also some metrics you can use here. So the first metric is uh, reserved instance coverage. How much of my workload am I enjoying a discount for? The second metric there is of the commitment I've made, how much of that commitment am I using? Because it's a commitment and you pay for it regardless of whether the resource is on or off. So finally, um, when it comes to designing for costs, as you can see on screen here, there are many different ways. And I'll just briefly talk about a few of them. Um, no need to be too shocked about this because these methods become more accessible and much more easy to use as you gain experience on AWS and as your engineering teams and technology teams gain more training on the platform as well. Um, quick story from uh, Capital One. So Capital One is a financial services institution in the US. And they did a study on cost efficiency and also performance versus team and their training. And so they laid it out on a matrix and they found that there's a very direct correlation between the training that teams get and the cost efficiency that they're able to drive and the performance as well. So I encourage you to take on the relevant training for your teams to improve efficiency too. And so going back here, um, just giving one example. One example is Amazon EC2 Spot. And it's an innovative technology that allows you to use the spare capacity within our data centers. So as you saw in the very, very first example where we had to meet peak demand and avoid waste, AWS itself has those challenges too. And we encourage customers to use all of the spare capacity where we are over provisioned for what's needed at the time at a significant discount. So if you're able to use AWS uh, Amazon EC2 Spot, then you save somewhere between 60%, um, about 70% on average, all the way up to 90% on your computing resources. And customers like uh, Clemson University in the US managed to spin up 1.1 million vCPUs uh, on AWS using Spot. Now, just think of that, something like 1.1 million laptops all at the same time doing your job and processing it. If you were to buy that many laptops yourself or computing uh, units, then it would cost millions of dollars. But on AWS for them, it only cost tens of thousands because they were able to spin it up, get it at a discount because it was spare, and then spin it down again once they were done. Another thing that can save a lot is through using open source software and databases, for example. Uh, one of our customers in the Philippines, by using Amazon Aurora databases, as opposed to uh, Oracle license databases, they were able to save about 1 million in licensing costs and maintenance fees. Um, Performance-wise, same. Price-wise, much better. And we've got programs that help with that as well. So many different options to explore, almost an infinite number of things to do, and I encourage you as much as possible to at least know about them and then automate them uh, with time as well. Now, you might have, we've expressed a few percentages here and there, 70%, um, 80%, um, and if I just demonstrate to you the next example is, what does that actually look like when you combine a few of these different levers together? So, this is a screenshot from a tool called the Simple Monthly Calculator. Uh, this one's being replaced by the AWS Pricing Calculator, but still quite useful. And at the top of the screen is a one single instance running on Red Hat 
and it costs $189 per month. This is a view of the world where you've just moved from your on-premises onto AWS, and that's how much it could cost. Now, as you make and apply these different optimization levers, the price can become a lot lower. And so, working down the page, I've asked, can we make this open source and run on an open source platform like Linux or CentOS? If yes, you save about 20%. Can this use the latest generation C5 instance instead of the C4 instance? There you save another 10 to 15%. Can I size it more closely to what it actually needs? There you save half. Um, what happens if I reserve it now using reserved instances? There you save another 30% or so. And if it's non-production, can I turn it off outside of work hours? There you another, save another 70%. And so the difference between the top and bottom here is 10x difference. Uh, customers I see who are operating at the top say, oh, I'm not sure about cloud, it's a bit expensive. Customers who are operating at the bottom go, this is amazing, this is great, let's do way more. And so this is a big reason why efficiency is important on the cloud. This is another customer, uh, Fender. If you're a fan of guitars and playing guitars and learning guitars, you might be familiar with these guys. And they have a website where they were able to drive 21 times more traffic to the website over time. Um, their cost didn't increase by 21x, or even double. They actually decreased their cost by 15% during this time. And that was through taking uh, advantage of the cloud native architectures and designing for cost. So after all of this effort and work, um, your finance team might be very happy and they might give you a hug and say, hey, great stuff. Um, but I also have this extra ask. How do we forecast to spend? How do we budget against what our expected spend was? Um, and how do we make sure that we have confidence that all of this is running well? So those efficiency metrics would have made a good amount of progress there, uh, but let's answer that next question. So, Having had the fortune to work with uh, many different customers who have been on the platform anywhere between brand new to six, seven years into the journey, I see many different behaviors and many different methods of managing spend. What I'd like to share with you now is uh, what I've actually seen in the market and what good really looks like. I might also start off with a bit of a quiz or a question. All right, hopefully your hands are ready to go up. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you will be, fairly straightforward, hopefully everyone raises their hand, is uh, do you know what a budget is? Yes? Everyone? Cool? All right, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Um, second question, do you currently operate to a budget on your cloud use? Yes, no? A few hands went down. Uh, next question, do you know what that budget is and is it forecast to hit that budget above or below? Yes, no? So a few less hands. Now, I guess uh, the point here is, it'll be good to understand those figures, and I'll share with you how you might build in a few practices to understand those types of metrics. Because with traditional financing, um, in the next slide I'll show is, the way traditional financing works is, there's, there's quite a lot of pressure placed on meeting budgets. So of the mature customers I've worked with, I've seen that the mature customers adapt their practices a bit. And I'm not saying you have to adapt your practices, um, but you might realize why it's uh, beneficial to adapt practices by the end of this section. The first difference is um, adapting your practices to changes uh, to how IT spend occurs, is that you're going from a large upfront prepaid investment into smaller, ongoing investments. Now, the implication of this is with large upfront investments, usually there's a lot of pre-planning, estimation of demand, uh, approvals with the finance team, uh, IT fills out these different forms, and there's a bit of process built in around that. When you change into smaller ongoing monthly type of spend, then it almost doesn't quite make sense to have big approval cycles every time you want to spin up that instance. So th there's implications and potential changes there. 
The second one is, uh, point number three, is spend is largely static once it hits business as usual budget. So I don't know um, how your budgeting processes work, but for many companies, you say three months before the financial year, I do all my planning, set the budget, get the commitment and decide I'm going to spend, who knows, five million, 10 million on IT for the next year. This has a bit of expectation on the fact that the spend will be static. And on cloud, it's quite different. Um, if you build it to auto scale up and down all the time based on your users, the spend is absolutely not static and it shouldn't be static. Also, in traditional infrastructure, it's very hard to undo your spend or optimize your spend after you provision it. On cloud, as you've seen, it's the opposite of that. So you can do a lot to optimize the spend and reduce the spend. And finally, um, the costs of traditional infrastructure quite often are somewhat hidden to the users. You might try to buy some service from a vendor and they may price it based on how much they think you can pay. Whereas on AWS, all of our prices are public and shared with customers. The implication there is that for people who are in procurement, quite often on their CVs, they, they're very proud to say, I've negotiated 10% here, I've negotiated 20% here, and driven savings for my company. But on cloud, yes, you can negotiate some savings, but all of that optimization activity you saw drives a 10x difference. It's not a factor of you know, a few percent here and there. There's that 10x difference sitting there available. And my question to you is, who's doing that? And so with the change in how IT spending occurs, many of the customers who've been on the platform for a while also think about how to change their IT financing practices. So what I've seen customers do is they take a lot of advantage of the trans uh, spend transparency that's available on AWS to drive the cost awareness to the engineers, to the developer teams. Now, one time um, I was traveling overseas and I got a quick notification from Singtel saying that, oh, uh, your overseas roaming is about to expire. That was a very good notification. I quickly switched off my roaming, roaming and saved uh, unexpected spend. Now, if I didn't get that notification and I managed using just my monthly invoice that comes from Singtel, I would have been surprised at the end of the month. This is kind of what happens and kind of what you have to manage on cloud as well. I encourage customers to move away from the monthly invoice way of managing to something that's more dynamic, fast, and provides more information uh, during the month. And so it's somewhat like moving from a world where you're in a parked car and you can look out the window every once in a while and check where things are going to a moving car where you should be looking out the window very often. So the tools available are Cost Explorer, AWS budgets that provides warnings. When spend hits certain thresholds, you can say, if my spend is expected to hit 110% of my budget, please send me an e email notification and let me know. And that's very similar to the Singtel roaming warning that I'm getting. And finally, uh, tags and allocation. So using tags, you can specify who owns the resource, um, what their email is, what cost center it belongs to, and so forth. And so imagine instead of managing just my own mobile phone, I was managing the mobile phone bills of 25 other people as well. I'd like to know whose warning it's coming from or who the warning is coming from. And through tags, you're able to answer that question really quickly. So the final metric that you might put into place to manage this is how am I doing against budget? Uh, and how, how complete is my tagging environment as well? And so if you think about this from, say for example, a sporting perspective, then things like right sizing, on-off scheduling, and RA efficiency are, are things like, am I eating well? Am I doing those push-ups? Uh, have I run 10 kilometers today? And the final one, spending against budgets, is what's actually realized. So am I winning my sports competitions that I expected to? I've also seen mature customers evolve and change their deployment and budgeting process as well. So let me share what I mean by that. 
So when it comes to estimating spend in the first place, um, you can use things like the simple pricing calculator uh, or the pricing calculator, the new one, and you can apply these different cost optimization levers that we've just talked about. And so you come with a spend expectation. Then you deploy your resources and see how much did it cost and compare that to your expectations. Now, after that, it could be well within expectations and you're happy and you go forward, or it could be higher or lower. And there's a decision point on, hey, let's do some cost optimization, if that makes sense to bring in more, bring it more within expectations. Once you're happy with it, you can deploy it, operationalize it, and bake it into your BAU budget. Now, before I go on, I'd like to share that for many new customers who are not familiar with cloud uh, IT operation and budgeting, quite often step one, step three, step four, and step five are all not there. And there is only step two. And for customers who only do step two, is that there's a bit of uh, ambiguity and a bit of lack of clarity as to how am I doing against my expected spend. Now, as we talked about earlier, um, lowering the cost of experimentation and failing fast is important as well. And so if you find that your experiment and your workload isn't adding the value expected or costing too much, then you can clear it out, end the project, and say, let's try something else and preserve your capital. And finally, um, as always, maybe after six months, maybe after one year, you find that these old applications, no one's really using them. And on cloud, you can actually delete those and clear those away as well to drive efficiencies. And so this difference is largely driven by the fact that the traditional IT um, budgeting process and planning process is quite different and you can optimize spend after you're on the platform. So we talked about estimating spends and just highlighting a few of the options available. Uh, for new workloads, consider your optimization levers. And for migrating workloads, usually um, the peak CPU and peak RAM of your workloads is somewhere between 40 to 45%. That's what studies have shown. And because you can size them better on the cloud, you can drive that up higher. And tools like TSO Logic can help you understand what is my existing environment, what do I have, and what is the utilization. If you want to self-serve, we have calculators like the Simple Monthly Calculator and the AWS Pricing Calculator, uh, but there are also some supported options as well. So feel free to talk to your account managers about that. So I've seen that mature customers also strike more of a balanced partnership with the finance function. Um, what I mean there is traditionally with the finance function, you only need to see them maybe once a year or once every two years when requesting new infrastructure. For customers who've been on AWS for a while, they find a lot of value in having monthly conversations or maybe even weekly conversations to talk about, hey, where's my spend going? How's it forecast? Or the engineering team telling the finance team, oh, actually, I need to spend more time on ensuring the security and the performance. I don't have time to cost optimize right now. Or, I need access to these tools. Uh, can you fund these tools for me? And the partnership allows both engineers and the finance function to do a better job and enhance what they can deliver for the organization. And so there are a few stories about this. Um, one company, it's a commercial company, you might have heard of them, Expedia, a travel booking company. They've gone through this journey and experience and they share with you exactly the different steps they took to uh, drive the efficiencies and uh, drive better success for the company. Uh, a very similar story, REA Group in Australia. They talk about how the finance and the operations function teamed up and joined, up, joined forces to make sure that they were able to make informed and well-informed um, decisions about their resource allocation and time allocation. And so to summarize what we've covered today, uh, we talked about the economics of AWS. Why millions of customers are using AWS? Because of cost savings, because of staff productivity, because of uptime, better resilience, and also the greater business agility as well. 
We've talked about how to manage your spend. So a few different ways to save, like sizing, turning things off, um, using reserved instances, and also designing for cost and how you might go about measuring them. And we talked about cloud financial maturity and ability to spend within budget. And so that's about using the tools to estimate the cost in the first place, Com doing a bit of comparison using things like Cost Explorer to see, hey, did it actually cost what I expected? And building that into your deployment cycles. Ultimately, that will let you spend to budget and maximize the value you realize on AWS. And so some of you have been taking photos throughout. Um, this one might be interesting as a takeaway gift. So this PDF infographic largely summarizes what I've talked about today, and you can give that to different people within your company or organization. And so it covers the economics, how to use AWS efficiently, and also managing spend as well. And a few additional learning resources too. So thank you very much for your attention today. I know it can be always challenging after lunch, uh, but if you enjoyed the talk, please do fill out the survey, and uh, thank you once again, and enjoy the rest of your summit. Thank you, Peter. Please remember to submit your feedback on this session in the app. You can redeem a free AWS branded swag at the Info Center if you complete a survey. If you are interested in having a copy of the slides, please tap your badge on the content devices at the exit. The next session in this room is the next lab in education, accelerating your journey through innovation, and it will begin promptly at 1.45 p.m. Thank you.